Every word, every word and picture, every character of text or crafted image is an accounting. It's a formula, a measure, a proportion or reckoning. In this way, uh, advance. In this way, all of art and even language are mathematical forms. Uh, the Pythagorean emphasis on number arose from the, their commitment to the idea that the whole world is number. Um, I wish I could see the other screen. Uh, yeah, the Pythagoreans thought that, uh, that all the laws of geometry and mathematics were in fact the laws of nature. Next. Unfortunately, these ideas got them in trouble. Pythagoras murdered in a bean field his students rounded up and burned alive in the school at Croton. Over the last uh, few years, I've found that even biology is a mathematic. This is the, these are the calculations for the codes for the microvenous icon, the first genetic art. Uh, these are the super codes that, uh, that I use to uh, code the Milky Way molecule. And the, all of the notions about supercode and, excuse me, silent code and DNA manifolds come from the notion that the genetic code itself can be expressed as a mathematic. And now with the uh, genomics, we have huge amounts of data. It's inherently mathematics. So recently, George Church tapped me on the shoulder and uh, said that my name had come up in faculty meeting, that we needed to think about art in the genetics department at Harvard Medical School. So this is an atrium at, uh, in the new research building with 186 or 87,000 stones, roughly 44,000 stones on the surface. I thought uh, I would number the stones. Originally, I thought I would, because there's no, uh, there's no plant in that garden, uh, I thought I would, I thought I would use the genome of the Macintosh or the Golden Delicious Apple, which has been sequenced. But looking into it, I found that, uh, that there's an apple on the slopes of a mountain range in Kazakhstan called Malus cerevisiae that has not been sequenced, and yet it's been recently shown to be the uh, ancestor of all domestic cultivars. This is the devil's own apple. Uh, uh, the Apple genetics community is, and so I committed to like organize a project to sequence the apple, and thus far I, an art museum in Florida, a company in Boston, and George Church himself have uh, agreed to involve themselves in the sequencing project. Uh, and the Apple genetics, genetics community has provided us with seeds and, uh, uh, and leaf tissue. But see, 44,000 stones isn't enough to, um, to, to hold that the number of stones on the surface or even 186,000 is nowhere near enough to hold all of the, unless the print is very small, the whole genome of the apple. So the gene that I proposed, so I can only print some of the, gene, some of the contents of the genome on the actual, even though I will sequence the, have the whole sequence, um, I, the, I selected the most ancient gene from the most ancient apple. This gene is the most abundant protein on Earth. It's Rubisco uh, ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. Uh, it's, um, if you broke down all the proteins on the planet, this would be the biggest, into, and put them into separate piles, this one would be the largest pile by far. It's, the sequence of this gene is the gene I, I transmitted into space from Arecibo on the 35th anniversary of uh, Frank Drake's um, trans famous transmission some several years ago. But see, this protein is the Eden protein. It's involved in the Calvin cycle. Um, it takes organic, inorganic carbon from atmosphere and converts it into food. The appearance of this gene, of this protein on the once barren earth brought forth all the verdant gardens, all of them, including Eden. And so the, the garden will hold, the garden at Harvard will hold the imprint of that legacy as well. Yesterday I mentioned in, uh, in the questions at, on stage at the 
pre-electronica that, uh, that artists need to open a window on the world and that, that because of that, we had to, in spite of the fragmentation of knowledge, we, we have to have a kind of general knowledge. Um, MIT has a, a, the slogan of MIT is mens et manus, that means hand and mind, that, that manual skill must be combined with rigorous scholarship. See, art can't have any relevance or immediacy in our own culture unless it's constantly refreshed with increasingly sophisticated symbols and architectures. Art is not just a visual language, it's a language of ideas. Uh, and that means part of the time we have to not just spontaneously make art, we have to like think, we have to order and contemplate. Uh, artistic practice can be just as precise and rigorous as any other discipline. Um, the, the origins of mathematics and art are shared and their separation is quite tragic. This is the Tetractus, it was the metaphysical icon of the Pythagoreans. And there's a reason, uh, a very subtle reason. Can anybody see the cube? Who says yes? That's good, there's two people see the, three people, more, that's great. <laughs> there is a cube, it's the number 10. Pythagoras gave us cube numbers and uh, square numbers, but he also gave us triangular numbers and trapezoidal numbers. Um, but there is a cube in the Tetractus. Um, and the, the idea that, that three dimensions can be uh, rendered in a two-dimensional space is something that blew the Pythagoreans away. That's why it's mystical. Um, can anybody see the cube? It's good. This is it, the contour of the same cube. So this notion, from this, uh, the Pythagoreans gave all the symbolism to, uh, to the Tetractus that survives to this day on the dollar bill. It's a Masonic symbol. Uh, it's the number 10. The top is the Godhead. Next two are the, uh, is duality. The next three are unity. And the bottom four are the four elements, earth, fire, air, and water. So, you know, thousands of years later came this guy, Roger Bacon, and he decided that numbers are not only the, um, the, the laws of nature, but the laws of God. And he suggested that all, or he wrote a letter to the Pope saying that every, all artists need to study mathematics. Uh, so, artists, did, before the telescope, they used uh, mathematical instruments to observe the heavens. Um, and what they found sort of disagreed with God, got these guys in a lot of trouble. Um, yeah, they were burned at the stake, sometimes with their books. So, uh, understanding exohexahedra, it's an exohexahedron is all of the space around an old idea. Uh, you, to understand exohexahedra, you have to have hexahedral awareness. You have to know about the box you're in. We see the cube, uh, but if you use the same, if you use the same facility to, to see the cube in that, in the previous slide, this, this slide, you will see something that can exist in, in uh, three dimensions. Uh, this is a, these are concentric heptagons. Heptagons are important to, uh, radio heads, um, this is called a spider coil, it's a flat coil, but it has to have an odd number of sides. It does the same job as a cylindrical coil, but if you wanna build one, usually you have to go to the web to, uh, uh, to download a template, because with a compass and a ruler, you can't make a heptagon. Um, there are, I mean, there are uh, perfect, so-called perfect polygons that you can make with compass and a ruler and protractor. There are 24 factors of 360. It's a convenient number, um, but only 24. Does anybody know why there are 360 degrees in a circle? Um, anybody ever worry about that? 
<laughs> well, the Babylonians, Gilgamesh and all that, the Mesopotamians, they thought that the sun revolved around the earth in 12, 30-day months, and the Greeks adopted that, and that's why we have 360 degrees to measure direction, time, and location. Uh, so with 360 degrees, you could make these polygons uh, because it's exact, precise, on the degree. But if you try to make a, another one like these, the fractions are this long and you have to overestimate or underestimate. It's like shooting pool. Um, you, you, the, your partner is like aims at the cue ball and then goes over here and, and aims at the ball, and the target ball in the pocket. And then you know that person is always going to over or underestimate the shot. Uh, you worry about the person who shoots from the hip. So if you try to make a, one of these polygons and blow it up really large where you're always going to have an, a gap or an overlap, Dürer, Albert Dürer in the 16th century or 15th century, he tried to figure out a way to make, uh, to make, to construct a regular heptagon, and uh, this was his method, but he was wrong. It's an irregular polygon. See, this is, it, the reason we're stuck with the built environment we have is because these are the tools we have to build the environment. Nature makes heptagonal fullerenes, and uh, there are many heptamers, seven-sided, seven-fold molecules with seven-fold symmetry in molecular biology. There are seven-fold hexagonally symmetric cacti, uh, starfish, and fungi, but we can't do it. For some strange reason, I haven't figured out why, there are 21 divots in every beer cap. 21 divots in every beer cap. And with beer caps, if you count the, the spaces, you can make a regular heptagon. Even though you can't do it with a ruler or a compass, or you can make it with beer caps. Um, so, so I made these uh, magic rings that uh, you could, um, um, that you could like assemble into, uh, into polygons, various polygons. And, and I thought they'd be good nerd, good jewelry for nerds. But they're a little tedious to work on, so I tried to come up with another uh, approach. I thought, well, so, so, keep going, ahead, go ahead, ahead. And there. Uh, I thought the radius stayed the same, so that if I just had these bars that connected the spheres that I, that I would get, but I learned something. I intuitively, I didn't understand that you can have equal, sides on many different shapes, not just the regular polygon. Um, so I got together with this uh, woman, Mando Wozniak. She's an engineer at uh, the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard Medical School. And we came up with the poly tractor. These are, um, these, we made new kinds of protractors with thousands of degrees, not 360 degrees. Uh, we made them for multiples of seven, for multiples of 11, for multiples of 13. And uh, to do so, we had to have a war with 360. It, it, in the most sophisticated software, we had to round off to hundreds of a degree, 360 degree. And then those errors uh, accumulated, and then we had to account for those errors. Um, at each step so that none of the degrees on the poly tractor are more than five thousandth of a degree off and that's pretty minute. Um, so then these are the poly tractor redux. To, uh, to operate them you, you have to line up zero with, with the number of sides you want on your polygon, this goes from three to 28. We, I just didn't want to put more on one because the lines would, uh, uh, and it, you can rapidly construct. I think everybody needs these, all graphic artists, mosaics, people who make stained glass, um, every carpenter and fabricator, every geometry student, they should be in every children's museum, every science museum. So. Are you tired of the same old hexahedra? Listen, how do you build the city of the future? You give them the tools. And one thing I learned a long time ago, that if you build a bridge, if you build a bridge sooner or later, 
somebody's going to come across. Thank you.